This is After Jackson, Cleveland's next mayor from IdeaStream Public Media. I'm Nick Castell. The defeated mayoral primary candidates are picking sides. Kevin Kelly and Justin Bibb have landed endorsements from two former opponents. Both mayoral hopefuls have been pitching themselves to Cleveland's African-American voters. We'll catch up on where they went and what they're saying. Plus, Issue 24 promises to remake civilian oversight of the Cleveland police. Leadership of the city's safety forces have launched their push against it. Before we go, remember the super PAC-funded Dennis the Menace mailer, the one that looked like a comic book? A political consultant behind that mailer steps into the light to talk about taking on the once boy mayor. And one more thing, early voting starts October 5th for most communities, but not for Cleveland and several others that held primary elections in September. Because the recount deadline is October 6th, those cities can't begin early voting until October 7th. But in any event, the votes will start coming in soon. Episode 12, Citizens and Change. Last week, former mayoral candidate Zach Reed endorsed Justin Bibb, and Ward 7 Councilman Bashir Jones backed Council President Kevin Kelly. In the primary, Bibb and Kelly found some of their strongest political support in wards that cover west side neighborhoods. Now they're enlisting east side politicians as their advocates. Reed hosted Bibb at the Zach Reed campaign headquarters on Kinsman Road in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood. I'm endorsing Justin Bibb to be the next mayor of the city of Cleveland. When it was Bibb's turn to speak, he pointed out his commonalities with Reed, their southeast side connection, their Christian backgrounds. And we are committed to turning the page from the failed politics and the politics of the past in this election. Because... As uh, Reverend Reed said, (laughs) we don't serve a master in this election, but one, God Almighty. And it's the failed plantation politics of the past that has gotten Cleveland to this point. And in this election, we got to turn the page. Reed told me afterward that Bibb had pledged to him that a Bibb administration would give southeast side neighborhoods like Mount Pleasant and Union Miles their fair shot at resources. I'm endorsing Justin because Justin has the plan, the policies and procedure to deal with the problems that existed yesterday, that exist today, and to erase those problems of tomorrow. But one of the main reasons I'm endorsing Justin is when I sat down with Justin and said to Justin, I don't want anything, I don't need anything. I need a mayor that's going to go down there and take care of the people here on the southeast side of the city of Cleveland. Reed used to represent Ward 2 on Cleveland City Council. This week, Bibb received another endorsement from a Ward 2 resident, Senator Sherrod Brown. Six miles up the road from that Reed event, Bashir Jones endorsed Kevin Kelly at a park in the St. Clair Superior neighborhood. Jones said that Kelly knew how to turn his ideas for Ward 7 into realities. And Kelly said making change in the city takes work. I think I can speak for my colleague and myself when I say that anybody can talk about change, but making change is hard. Yes. Making change means bringing people together. Making change means identifying resources. Making change is more difficult than talking about change, but it can be done when committed people come together with common values. And that's how Councilman Jones and I have worked together, and that's how I'm gonna continue to work as mayor. Jones touched on the elephant in, well, the park. That elephant is this. Kelly is a white candidate who needs black support if he wants to come out ahead of a black opponent. All right, this race? is beyond race. I am no one's fool, and my community is no one's fool. We understand what's going on. This race is beyond race. This race is about renaissance, it's about results, and it's about resources. And our community, especially on the east side of Cleveland, needs the resources. By that, Jones meant don't vote for Bibb just because he's black. And don't discount Kelly just because he's white. Then Jones took it a step further. He didn't mention Bibb's name, but he didn't have to. We understand 
that what has happened in this race has happened in very few places across the country, which is someone who has come from nowhere. And we have no idea who they are or where they came from. But a system has stood behind them. You know, Malcolm said something very powerful. He said that the media will make you love your enemies and hate your friends. All right. With that Malcolm X quote, Jones seemed to be saying that the system backing Bibb was the media. The Plain Dealer endorsed Bibb before the primary, and a week after this event, Crane's Cleveland Business endorsed Bibb, too. If you followed this race closely, there was something about last week's events that felt different, a change in the dynamics of the race. Listen to how Reed, Bibb, and Jones interacted just a few months ago at a rousing forum in West Park. Thank you very much, and I appreciate you all being here tonight. Uh, let me just say this. Uh, you can't run away from your record, and you can't run away from things that you've said. Reed used his time here to go after Jones over whether he supported defunding the police. Jones said he didn't. Then Reed turned his attention to Bibb and his origin story set at his grandmother's home on Dove Avenue. And when someone tells you they come from Mount Pleasant, I represented Mount Pleasant for 17 years. 123rd and Dove, you got a phone, go home tonight, look, up, look on your computer, is in Union Miles. It is not in Mount Pleasant. I grew up in Mount Pleasant on 139th and Kinsman. If you go by the statistical planning area boundaries set by the Cleveland Planning Commission, Reed was correct. The planning area lines were redrawn in 2012. Before that, Bibb's grandmother's home was in the Corlett neighborhood, which was written out of the current map. At the time, the Mount Pleasant boundary was about an eight-minute walk to the north. In any event, what was really interesting was what Bashir Jones said after this. Reed had attacked him and Bibb, and Jones stuck up for himself and for his fellow 30-something candidate. You know, that's the issue with our city, by the way. You have older black leadership who attack the new young black leadership. So now you're not going to catch me attacking Bibbs because him and I, we have the same mission to make this city better, even if we ride in different cars. But that's the issue with our city. Older black leadership who tried to tear down young black leadership, stepping on the caterpillars as if the sky is not big enough for all the butterflies. That's the problem. But that was back in July. In late September, in that park in St. Clair Superior with Kevin Kelly, Jones aimed his shoe at a caterpillar named Justin Bibb. That prompted this question from one of my colleagues in the Cleveland Press Corps, Sam Allard of the alt-weekly Cleveland Scene. Um, Councilman, um, during the primary, you were often uh, aligned pretty closely with uh, Kelly's competitor, Justin Bibb, young black leaders who were challenging the status quo. Uh, it frankly seemed like kind of a natural alliance. Uh, today, you're kind of referring to him as someone that people have never heard of, no idea where he came from. The question, have you had a change of heart? Jones turned it back around on the press. So it's interesting that a system and media who has stood behind somebody who we clearly, see that's just, for you to say that I'm aligned with Bib is just like, because we both black. That's the reason why That's exactly that. right. That's the only, that's, that's, and that that's, needs that's the only to reason, stop. That's the only reason you say that. And that needs to stop. Because him and I, we don't come from the it's same true. community. We don't have the same lived experiences. We don't have the same values. Maybe because we're black and we code for the same fraternity that maybe it seems like we... But in reality, the media needs to do a better job. We have lazy media. Terrible media. media. Terrible. I mean, mention yes, the fact of what yep. President Kevin Kelly has done. So there you have it. Even if Jones noted parallels between himself and Bibb in the past, at the end of the day, he's on Team Kelly. And in speaking to black voters, he's vouching for Kelly while questioning Bibb's authenticity. A day later, as if in rebuttal, Bibb took to the steps of Greater Friendship Baptist Church in the Glenville neighborhood to receive the endorsements of a large contingent of prominent pastors. Among them was Reverend Otis Moss Jr., a leading elder of Cleveland's African-American religious community. So if you are old, are growing old, are praying to live to get old, make sure you have a ballot in your hand, a vision in your heart, and the name Justin Bibb on the ballot. 
Moss is 86 and set out to diffuse criticism that Bibb is too young for such a big job. Take 19-year-old Joan of Arc, Moss said. Take Martin Luther King Jr., who was 26 at the time of the Montgomery bus boycott. And, of course, take that 33-year-old teacher from Nazareth. So if we have this kind of record, what is the argument about a mayor at 34? That's early enough to do a lot of good for a long time. Amen and praise God. When it was Bibb's turn at the microphone, he promised better policing and a more agile city government. We also can't wait for a city hall that is modern and responsive and not working in 1980, but in 2021. Why is it that my, my grandma Sarah, who's 92, got to call four or five departments to get her grass cut? The general election may well hinge on the Grand Maceras of Cleveland, the older African-American homeowners in places like Union Miles, Mount Pleasant, Lee Harvard or Glenville. They're reliable voters, but the candidates that won their neighborhoods in the primary are out of the race. People like Bashir Jones or Zach Reed could point them in a new direction. Cleveland voters will decide this fall whether to greatly expand the powers of the Community Police Commission, giving it a say in the officer discipline process. Issue 24, as it's known, has divided the two mayoral candidates. Justin Bibb supports it. Kevin Kelly opposes it. Here's Sabod Chandra, an attorney and the ballot issue's primary author. At the end of the day, this charter amendment is addressing a fundamental failure in our current accountability system. Right now, we have a police chief, and we have had a police chief for several years, who fails to hold officers accountable for police misconduct. That police chief, Calvin Williams, opposes the measure and disputes that characterization. Not long ago, I talked about the amendment with my colleague Matt Richmond, who covers criminal justice for IdeaStream Public Media. He offered an in-depth look at what the amendment would do and how it has influenced Cleveland's conversation about police reform. What new powers would the Community Police Commission get if voters approved this this issue? Their authority over police discipline would um, be strengthened. Right, right now, they don't have any authority over that. And this puts an extra layer after the public safety director. So the public safety director hands down the discipline and then the Community Police Commission can review it and change it. And, you know, that they would have to stay within, I mean, it would have to be a violation of police policy that they would be disciplining an officer for. There's a discipline matrix that they would have to follow. And then, you know, they would also have authority, and it's not really spelled out how this would work, but they would have authority over police policies, procedures, and training. Um, so, you know, you can picture if say, Cleveland Division of Police wanted to expand the use of uh, cameras or start using, say, facial rec recognition technology. Those sorts of policies would need some kind of approval from the Community Police Commission. And on the issue of discipline, what this means is if the safety director hands down a, a suspension, let's say, and if the Community Police Commission feels that termination was more warranted, they could review that discipline and possibly increase the severity. Yes. You know, the, by state law, there's still arbitration that whatever discipline they hand down could be appealed to an arbitrator. And if it's not, if it doesn't adhere to the union contract and doesn't adhere to policies, then it could be reversed. Right. So, and this is a very common thing that the police union will appeal discipline. It will go to an arbitrator. In some cases, it might even be appealed beyond that to a, a judge. And uh, often the union is pretty successful in winning those cases. Yeah. I and, mean, you know, one of the things that you face when you're in front of an arbitrator is they'll, they'll look at previous discipline for similar uh, infractions. So, you know, it would be very difficult to all of a sudden 
make discipline much more harsh than in the past. So issue 24 also gives the Community Police Commission new investigative powers. Can you explain what what would they be able to do uh, if this issue were approved by voters? Yeah, this is some of the most controversial parts of the the, the amendment. One of the new powers that this commission would have would be to... um, to solicit, gather, compile, organize, maintain, and regularly update in- information on individual police officers whose career records or personal history me- merit designation or disclosure. Um, and then having those files, requiring that those files be publicly available. Um, and then they can also direct the Civilian Police Review Board to independently investigate the conduct of every police officer against whom a lawsuit has been threatened or filed. I think that provision uh, really makes people in the administration, people in the police department shudder at the thought that, you know, all you have to do is threaten a lawsuit and then they can have the Civilian Police Review Board, OPS, and the Community Police Commission start investigating an officer and make them make whatever they find out public. So you mentioned Mayor Frank Jackson's administration and their opposition to this measure. Last week, uh, the safety director and the police chief went to Cleveland City Council. The council had called a hearing on on this issue uh, to gather information about it. And the chief and the safety director made very clear that they were opposed to it. What was their what was their argument? Well, first, public safety director Carrie Howard uh, made a legal argument against it and talked about, you know, usually in an investigation, there are rules about uh, what standard of uh, proof are required. And he questioned whether there would be any. I think that it's important to point out that the amendment so compromises what due process is that it, it expressly states that you cannot interpret anything within the amendment to be a violation of due process. And so in that meeting, um, Subodh Chandra, who's a, who's a former law director for Cleveland and now works as a civil rights attorney here, um, he, you know, made the argument that because CPC is just being put as another layer on top of the existing process, that what's going to happen is that underneath it at the OPS level and the Civilian Police Review Board, and, you know, if it's something that's investigated internally too, that there's going to be an airing of the facts below CPC. And once it gets to CPC, it's just to review all that investigation that, you know, does follow due process and does have all those requirements that Director Howard was uh, talking about. All we're doing is saying that after the safety director, there is civilian input into the adequacy of discipline. And if the civilians determine that the discipline was inadequate, which I doubt they're going to do very often, uh, if if they determine that, then that is the final say on behalf of the city. And then the officers still have their arbitration process at that point. Now, the police chief, Calvin Williams, he was also at this city council hearing. He has been the chief in charge of the police department during the entire consent decree process. But he is against issue 24. What what was his case against it? He made a, a few different points. I mean, first of all, you know, he came with some statistics about the drops in, um, in, in use of force since basically the start of the uh, consent decree and, you know, took offense at the idea that, you know, they weren't reforming the police department. The progress wasn't being made. I am the reform police chief. I've been in this consent decree process from the beginning. I sat at the table at every meeting and every negotiation. I sat in every community meeting. We want reform in this police division and we're getting reform. We're getting there. This is gonna set us back 10 years. And, you know, as far as the idea of having civilian oversight of the police department, on one hand, you know, he he said that this would hurt recruitment and retention of officers. Officers are gonna leave this division in droves, good officers, because they see this as bad, bad legislation. It talks about complete civilian oversight, The military has civilian oversight in this country. The president does not decide what discipline a soldier gets in the Marine Corps or the Air Force. He lets his generals do their job. This legislation takes that power out of my hand as the chief 
out of the safety director's hands and puts it in charge of civilians that have no training in police and what we do day in and day out. And the citizens of the city deserve better. One issue that we have seen as the the city has tried to comply with the consent decree is this tension between uh, the the city, uh, the Department of Police, and the Community Police Commission. The the monitoring team that oversees the consent decree has raised this issue, saying that there is not a good working relationship between the Community Police Commission and the city. And uh, and Calvin Williams even addressed this issue in the in the council hearing, didn't he? Yeah. And and it was pretty surprising because, you know, that one of the things that they have to do to complete the consent decree is have good relations with the Community Police Commission is to, you know, listen to their input um, and to work with them. And so, you know, it was surprising to hear Chief Williams just let let loose on his problems with the commission as it exists right now. They have constantly, constantly badgered this division from day one, and they have not been a collaborative partner as they should be, as was written in the consent decree from day one. And our division does not trust them to be that neutral third party that's going to look at a chief's decision or director's decision and say, yes, that's a fair decision. Very recently, the federal judge Solomon Oliver overseeing the consent decree had to step in because there was a dispute between the uh, CPC and the city over some records that the CPC wanted. It's really coming to a head between these these two parts of the consent decree. So if we boil down all these arguments, basically what it comes down to is Uh, The supporters of Issue 24 say uh, we need stronger and longer lasting police oversight uh, by civilians when the consent decree ends. And uh, the city and opponents of this are saying, but this specific measure goes too far. Is that a fair characterization? Right. And at that city council meeting last week, left to defend it primarily was was Subodh Chandra, who was the primary author of it. And this is what their pitch boils down to. And what I would suggest to the members of council and to the public is this. If you truly believe there's no problem with police accountability in this city, then you should vote against it. And, you know, I I went out with them when they were collecting signatures and that, you know, it was a one line pitch. Do you want more civilian oversight of the police department? then vote vote yes or put your signature down to get this on the ballot. And the city and the opponents, they have a bit of a more difficult job and they are trying to drill down into what's into some of the details of the amendment. Ideastream Public Media's Matt Richmond giving us a look at issue 24, the Police Commission Charter Amendment. Back in the primary, the Super PAC Citizens for Change paid for an eight-page glossy mailer calling Dennis Kucinich a menace to Cleveland. The mailer revisited the two turbulent years that Kucinich was mayor. The blizzard of 1978, conflicts with the police department. The mailer even claimed Kucinich bankrupted the city. In fact, the city defaulted on about $14 million in short-term notes but did not file for bankruptcy. In any event, the message was sent, and Kucinich seemed to have early notice this was all coming, or at least he reacted quickly in the moment. His campaign printed up its own piece parodying the attack mailer. The Democratic consulting firm behind that Dennis the Menace eight-pager is a company based in San Francisco called Bauman Merrill. They specialize in mailers and even did some work for Chantel Brown's victorious congressional Democratic primary campaign. In an email sent around after the election, Bauman Merrill called itself a game changer in the mayor's race, pointing out that Kucinich lost and Council President Kevin Kelly landed a top two spot. Katie Merrill is a Democratic strategist and one of Bauman Merrill's partners. She grew up in Newark, Ohio, about 40 minutes east of Columbus. So anything we can do in Cleveland, we're happy to do. And so when Citizens for Change asked us to do um, some mail, Uh, We came up with this eight-page comic book. Citizens for Change also paid for TV and radio ads, as well as for a mailer attacking Justin Bibb. Merrill says her firm did not work on those. She says her only contribution was the Dennis the Menace piece. Cleveland's in a precarious position, as are many big cities around the country, coming out of the pandemic and the economic downturn. And so this race is critical. 
uh, for um, uh, business development, for economic development, for uh, for voters' everyday lives and their economic security. And so we felt that the the record of Dennis Kucinich, and he really was a menace to Cleveland in um, in the seventies when he was mayor, needed to be made clear to voters. And of course, it was you know we're talking almost. 50 years ago, 40 something years ago. So, um, uh, so there are a lot of new voters who probably were not aware, um, of, of his record as mayor. Why was, why did you feel, or why did the PAC feel that it was important to do something so substantial as, as a multi-page mailer like this? You know, our sense having done mail for years now, uh, is that mail is a, uh, a perfect long form medium. So you can watch a 30 second TV commercial, but there was a long story to tell. And it was, um, uh, and there was a lot of content. And so mail is, is the only political medium that allows you to tell that long story. And so that was one, but we also people, you know, people get political mail all the time. Uh, They get a, eight by 11 postcard. They look at it. It's got some black and background and red letters. Oh, this is a scary negative piece. And they throw it in the trash, right? Because they get it all the time. So we knew we needed to do something original to get people's attention. What was the goal of the mailer? I mean, was it merely to uh, sink Kucinich's chances in the mayor's race? Or was it to elevate other candidates like uh, Kevin Kelly, who really offered himself as a foil or an alternative to someone like Kucinich? Our goal was to tell the, the story about Dennis Kucinich. And and essentially, look, when voters are making a decision, <laughs> uh, it's really about first do no harm. And we believe that the election of Kucinich would do great harm. And so in the interest of first do no harm, our primary goal was to educate people uh, about the record of Dennis Kucinich and what it would mean for Cleveland, and then let the voters decide on their own with all the other communication they were getting from the other campaigns who they actually wanted to vote for. Well, would you say that you succeeded? Yes, I would say we succeeded. I mean, I I think the fact that anytime your opponent takes your theme and tries to turn it into something for themselves, you know that that you uh, are have been a game changer in the race. It might have been the day the mail the mailer hit. There was a debate. Dennis Kucinich tried to use the Dennis the Menace theme to say that he was a a menace to crime and a menace to other things uh, in trying to make them. it turn it positive. That's correct. Yes, I am a menace. I'm a menace to violent criminals who are running in the streets. I'm a menace to banks who redline. I'm a menace to utilities which price gouge people. I'm a menace to crooked politicians who steal from the taxpayers and to those who look the other way. He then took a basically designed a mail piece that looked exactly like ours, mailed it out, trying to say the same sort of um, messaging and uh, and he didn't succeed. When you create a mail piece that de- then becomes the dynamic in the race, uh, the, and Dennis the Menace became the dynamic in the race, uh, we would say we succeeded. And and that doesn't always happen. Um, I wanted to go back to a question I had asked earlier about, you know, sort of what you or what the PAC was hoping to achieve in this race. I know, obviously, one of the things was to uh, you know, make sure that that Dennis Kucinich did not win the election. Um, I think I saw in an email that that Bauman Merrill had sent out, you know, a mention of of Kevin Kelly uh, succeeding in the primary as an example of of success. I mean, was there an effort to try to help his candidacy in all this? Well, I mean, our primary uh, focus was to make sure Kucinich didn't get through. Um, now, uh, you know. That it was basically the way the the results um, came in. Kelly just edged out Kucinich. We personally think Kelly is a great candidate, um, but that was not the uh, that was not the purpose of the mail so much as it was to to make sure that Kucinich was not um, uh, was not did not get, make it into the runoff. One other question that I know always 
kind of comes up when we're dealing with, let's say, super PACs and other entities like that, um, you know, because of the filing schedule that they have to abide abide by, uh, we're not going to know who the funders are until January after the election. You know, in your view, is it is it fair or is it right that a PAC can spend money on a race like this, but voters won't really know who they are until after the ballots are counted? You know, I think the role of independent expenditures in general um, are becoming more and more critical to campaigns. Um, and so, you know, we see it in California all the time. You know, we see it nationally, sort of late coming to Ohio in, in these local elections. Um, but they're, they, they, because it's so difficult for campaigns to run both positive about themselves and negative about their opponents, particularly in a multi-candidate race, you see, you're going to see more activity by independent expenditures. Now, uh, in terms of disclosure and the rules around those IEs, that is something that needs to be dealt with at the federal level, needs to be dealt with at the state level, needs to be dealt with at the local level. Katie Merrill is a partner at Bauman Merrill, the Democratic consulting firm that came up with the Dennis the Menace mailers. And by the way, I did ask if she could identify who was behind Citizens for Change, the super PAC that paid for the work. Merrill said I should talk to the PAC about that. If you've listened to previous episodes, you know how that's gone. I also asked Dennis Kucinich if he'd like a chance to respond to this interview. He declined the opportunity. This is After Jackson, Cleveland's next mayor from IdeaStream Public Media. A quick correction, last week I referred to Cleveland doubles as split-level homes. That is not the right term. They are duplexes, not split levels. Next week, Kevin Kelly and Justin Bibb meet for the general election mayoral debate. Our podcast is edited by Annie Wu and Mike McIntyre, music produced in collaboration with Drew Mazius. Special thanks to Matt Richmond for his reporting this week. I'm Nick Castell. Talk to you soon.